I'm Dr. Sadeesh. I'm working as a medical health manager in Victor and Dickinson. So, uh, mostly today I'm going to talk about the process excellence of liver tapping. First of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. Anita Salat, for giving us a fantastic opportunity to talk about this. Uh, Devotami and this process excellence and giving us the opportunity for this uh, to be the, and this is a fantastic initiative and the ARC is doing it and uh, last year, I think, it, not last year, we put that Dr. Gopinda has came and uh, spoke about it. So we are getting the continuous opportunity here. So when I was uh, actually looking at Dr. Aditya's Parents uh, presentation. So I was thinking that uh, so that is the thing I was going to talk, and once she presented uh, so nicely, and <laughs> I have nothing to talk about. <laughs> I just ran through the slides because I wanted to finish it. <laughs> and that was so fantastic. I mean, you covered every point, everything what a process ex excellence supposed to be, and what a person I mean as a laboratory personnel and the laboratory said I also worked as a laboratory personnel for several years. So I was thinking second behind that if I would have known all those things, I would have been a better laboratory professional during my, my, my earlier days. So anyway, so I little bit change the slide after seeing that. Sorry. <laughs> it's fantastic actually. It was very enlightening for me. So but in BD, you know, BD is always come to you guys in so many laboratories and tell you, Madam, Kumari Basi, but many of the time you must be getting okay. But that's, of course, part of our daily life. But apart from that, we really need to focus on the uh, quality. Not only the product quality, but the quality work inside the laboratory. Because our goal is just not uh, to uh, talk about a product, sell a product. Our goal is to improve the quality of the work inside the laboratory and also anything, any process end to end related to a specimen. Because what we really need inside our organization and we're trying to uh, set it up, I mean, convey this message is that a specimen is just not a specimen. A specimen is actually representing an individual, right? Because that specimen is going to decide, the result is going, uh, the data was giving so many of case studies that space based on this diagnostic space somebody's life was saved and somebody's life was couldn't be saved so a specimen is just what we believe in it's just not a specimen it's just not a blood it's just not a team it's just someone is actually represented by that to a well or one another blood. so improvement in specimen quality is our one of our uh, motto in our organization so to improve the specimen quality we do run, apart from all those things, products and all those things, we do run process excellence services to our laboratory professionals. So what we do actually is that we design so many training programs for laboratories and laboratory personnel. And those training programs are continuous training programs. So as we are dealing with the pre-analytical phases, so we mostly focused on the pre-analytical uh, part of the laboratory processes. So what we believe is that, see, the thing is, if you go to any sophisticated laboratory or advanced laboratory, any laboratory now these days, they will invest so many million dollars of money in their analytical test laboratory, they will buy all the automatic systems, they will place the automatic track inside the laboratory. The most least amount of investment or least amount of focus comes to the pre-analytical phases, but most error occurs at the pre-analytical phases. 
So previous studies have shown that we were almost 16 to 70 percent error. Whatever is happening is happened during the clear identity analysis. Because your laboratory is so sophisticated, you guys are so trained inside the laboratory. You take care of all the GCLP, all the good laboratory practices. There are very little chance of happening the error. But error happens. That it is inevitable. Sometimes it happens. But seventy percent of error happens in the reality practices, and that happens not only because just that we don't know, we all know everything, but we need to what we believe in is need to. We require the continuous, continuous brushing up of the knowledge, right? So, what we see in that in laboratory there are uh, four phases, you know, I mean, uh, I mean three phases: pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical. Right? So, if you see in this pie chart, is that 16 percent pre-analytical error happens, and well, least and error happens at the analytical phases. So do we? Uh, so we do focus on this. Uh, we will focus on this pre-analytical phases. So pre-analytical phases are actually divided into two parts. One is inside the, the laboratory. One is outside the laboratory. So when we talk about the outside the laboratory, it starts from the ordering the test. So a person comes. He wants to do a test. So you will order a test and then you will go for some clever term start the technician will report to that person either their home or in their ward, if he is admitted in the hospital or if he is in the OBD. They will collect the sample, then they will transport the sample. Madam was talking about it, transport the sample, labeling the sample, collect the samples. So those are the things he was actually talking about the pre-analytical phases where, where most of the error happens. Many a times we have seen uh, that sometimes what happens that uh, in most in IPD where open collection happens, but sisters or nurses do they collect the blood from the vacuum tender and I'm sorry, the series and they transfer that blood uh, directly to the vacuum tender, right? Because you use the vacuum tender tube for the transport of the sample. And sometimes what they do, they will remove the rubber remove it. And after they remove the yogurt, they don't know which one is the gel and uh, irritate you, which is the red tube actually. So the mistakes in the order of it now. So I'm just keeping few uh, areas where actually mistakes happen. It, it is not intentional just because we need to brush up the uh, pre analytical cases. So what Madam was talking about this once the test is ordered. Then you complete the order for form and then you deploy the staff for collection. Once the staff is deployed, he goes to the sample collection, he locate the patients, prepare the patients, and then he starts his process. Here it is very important. Your best practices are clever technique when you collect the samples, where you need, you need to maintain the proper procedures of the uh, identification, disinfection, site uh, selection, then you do the sample collection, and there you have to follow the order of draw, and then you complete your processes. Right? During this entire process, there are so many things. I need one or two examples. Right? We always talk about when we go for the training program, and we come to the training program, what we have in our in our bus here. It's not. I mean, I'm not here to. Send you that because these are your first training, training program, anyone can ever it. So, no worry about that. But I'll tell you. So, many of the time we have seen in my personal experience also the small things when you clean your site with 70% alcohol, sometimes you do not give enough time to dry the area. Right? Maybe you, sometimes the people have a lot of workload to there. And those small things that excess alcohol what is present in the site, they sometimes create uh, improper result. I'll give you one of my own example. So we were uh, in a laboratory, we were doing some study, a research study we were doing, and we had to study the uh, potassium level. So we required a few volunteers. So I thought, okay, let me give the blood sample there. So I was the volunteers. 
But it was happening when you were collecting blood samples from both the hand with two different devices. And when the phlebotomist was collecting the blood samples, he was she was learning of hurry. So from my deference, he collected properly, she followed all the best practices of phlebotomy. But when he came to collect my right hand, she was a little bit I mean, you know, in uh, as at first. So she collected she uh, uh, my uh, Side, clean the side, and she didn't need the enough time to rub out the, I mean, try out the alcohol. And she collected the blood. And then we got the result. We had almost 60, 70 results. And all the results are perfectly comparable, except of my potassium. So from my left hand, uh, left hand, the potassium came normal, but in my right hand, potassium came 5.7, which is higher. So it is just an example. It's a very small thing, which we sometimes forget to follow, but it is when we talk about GCNP, we need to follow each and every step, however insignificant it might feel to you, but each and every small step has a lot of significance when we talk about that. Right. So after that, we go to the transport of sample. It's very important because, you know, as the every laboratory has the pneumatic stores for those things. There are different, different transport boxes, temperature control, all those things. But, but sometimes what we see, when you walk out is very high, you give the sample to your housekeeping guys. What they will do, be very mindful about that. What they will do, they, take the, they will take the sample, put it in the lab. They will run to the laboratory. It happens. So when they do these kind of things, many things happen. I, mean, I think six or many people have seen this also. There is a chance of spillage, cross contamination, and I sample might be having the improper transport condition. Right. So these are very small things. For example, I have seen some so many people they are transporting the urine sample, urine. Uh, that container through, so through the pneumatic suit. And maybe 10 samples, 20 samples, 50 samples were nothing happened. But one sample lived inside the pneumatic suit, and entire pneumatic suit is contaminated. Right? So these are the very small things, but we need to be very mindful about it. You know all the protocol, you are thoroughly trained about it, but you just need to follow the protocol. So these are the things after we receive the samples in the laboratory, we go for the accession and the verification, and then we sort out the sample, then we send it to the different different laboratories. Then right. I'll give you one example. So in a very big private hospital, so we are continuously getting a complaint inside the sir active healthy. I get to come in a machine pet out there, or machine to block the block or something. So we were very concerned about it because uh, all we talk about BD is all talk about quality. We don't compromise in anything. So what is happening with our team, right? So we went there, we started their process and we, we were quite not able to understand what is happening. We were doing the back investigation if the lot is problematic or not. We were, there was nothing. So, artistically, I want to say, she observed one thing is that they are collecting the blood sample, immediately transporting it to the lab. When the blood sample is in accession, the person who is sitting for the center view, he says immediately putting it in the center view. And those are all gel tubes, plotting tube. And the IVQ instruction for him says that you have to give them 30 minutes of incubation period of the plotting time. And when we actually did this time level investigation, we found out that within 15 minutes they are doing the centrifugation because they have the workload. Then we told them, see, you have a workload, you need to finish it within your TAT, but it is very important to give them give these blood samples to the proper printing time. Because if we, it, it might seem visually that the bread is clotted, but it is actually not clotted. So when we give the improper clotting and then we send the music, then it will create a lot of hybrid formation, 
which you call latent fine data. Yes. So those fairly late time information, and there is an atom any microwave the fine data is there, or any kind of improper sample integrity is there, basically, they will block your code because now these days this instrument, automated instruments are so sensitive. So much of they, they are very, uh, I mean, you know, very sensitive instrument, they, they will not accept it. They will always reject those samples. So at a flavor database level, yeah, at our at a sample collection level, we do not we, we don't feel like that what is the I mean, we don't see the repetition of the sample getting delayed or the sample getting repeated when you need to collect the repeat sample because effect it doesn't affect us, it affects the patient who is taking who is giving the sample, right? So one day delay, two day delay, it means a lot. And it means a lot for a clinician also because they are waiting for the result to start their therapy or whatever the treatment they are uh, trying to take. Okay. So these are the pre analytical uh, when inside the laboratory we need to uh, keep check all those things like this how you are receiving the sample, how much time you are giving for the uh, incubation, and then prepare the sample for the test testing. But what is the centrifuge seed always I you always see that the people always get a mix up with the RPM and the RCF right so maybe uh, so people are uh, it's written that 3500 RPM you have to uh, centrifuge for the 10 minutes said so that's a general protocol but if you see you will have written centrifuge might be the setting is in the RCF or the G and you are putting it in the 3500 RCF. So what I spoke initially, it's not much. You just have to be mindful. You just have to be very observant that what I'm doing, what Madam was saying, that what I'm doing and what I need to do actually. So then, uh, then transport the sample to the lab selection. That's uh, I think you guys all know. So this is called the pre-analytical error, but it happens. And mostly, one thing we always be more thing we always uh, very uh, we pressure on those few points is the volume of the samples and order of draw and the inversion of the samples and the tonic and timing. So uh, if you see on any guideline. CLS guideline, top nature guideline. So they will uh, always talk about the tunicate timing is not more than 60 seconds. Right. So, but if you feel, if I talk about, I have spoken with a lot of people that listen, they always talk about, you know, if I have 782, I will keep the tunicate for the 782 because if I remove the tunicate, the blood sample will not, the blood flow will reduce. Right. But the thing is, if you have a Larger volume of samples to collect, like seven, eight views of samples to collect. It is very evident that the eight views they will have a very less than blood flow because blood vessels will try to collapse. And maybe the, most of you must have faced that your fluoride tube doesn't have the pressure, right? The blood sample comes very slowly. The fluoride tubes are designed such way. They have a very low pressure because a small volume of samples, and you just have to keep the blood samples for I mean, tube for a little bit of more time inside the bed so the entire blood should come. What I'm trying to make you understand is that volume is very important for any kind of sampling. The prescribed volume. What I mean to say prescribed volume is to see any like it has written two things. One is the concentration, another one is the Volume of the sample, then the concentration what is written it is the concentration of the additive. That means if you draw the full volume inside the tube, then only you will be actually you will be able to achieve that concentration what is written on the tube. What is that? That means if you have, for an example, it declared and the x amount of I mean x concentration is written. So that means if you draw 3 ml of blood, if it's a 3 ml tube, if you draw 3 ml of blood, then the additive concentration inside the blood will reach what it is written. If you draw 2 ml of blood, additive concentration will be higher. If you draw a higher ml of blood, then the additive concentration will be lesser. So the additive concentration, if it is not in a proper way, then 
the function of the anti, what it is supposed to do, it will not do. So if it is an anticoagulant, it will not do the coagulation, I mean anticoagulation properly. If it is a clotting tube, it will not do it function properly. So the volume is very important. Then comes the order of drop. Order of drop, what we talk about, you always take the cited first, then you take the your clotting tube, what the rate tube, then you go for the evaporating tube. Then you go for the DQ tube and then after you take to write to right. So you all know why the order of draw is prescribed because if we do not follow the order of draw, there is a higher chance of anti cross contamination from one DQ. So sometimes if this doesn't happen in the OPD, but the rare condition order of draw is not followed in the OPD, but uh, Several times it was sometimes not followed inside the IPT because they might be doing open collection. And what I example I initially gave you that I have seen uh, one sister who was doing that they collected the blood in the uh, syringe and they were transferring this uh, plunging on the blood inside the blood. What they did, they removed the once they removed the hemoglobin, they were very uh, they just put in first entity and then blood to the clotting tube. So the order of draw was hampered there. So they put the blood in the DDA, the needle was touched in the DDA, that needle they put it in the clotting tube. So the function of clotting tube was hampered because it has a very micro level of EDTA there and it is functionally say anticoagulant and the clotting tube is supposed to clot the blood. So it's not supposed to anticoagulate the blood, right? So these are the things you need to be a little bit mindful about it. And uh, next is what we talk about is uh, the attributes of a good phlebotomist. I was supposed to put that, uh, I mean, the slide was initially for the phlebotomist, but it is uh, true for everyone. I mean, this is such a slide is true for any professional at any industry. We talk about phlebotomist. Uh, we are here, we are talking about phlebotomist, but remember one thing, we have a training program actually where we talk about the soft skill, how you need to communicate with your patient, what should be your body language, what should be, how you should make an eye contact with your patient. So from where that package I took this slide. So it says that what what it means to be a professional. A professional should have three types of skills, I mean three types of attributes. One is the adequate amount of knowledge. So when I talk about adequate amount of knowledge, see, we are at a different level, right? Somebody is working at a flippertabist, I am working at the uh, different side of the table. Somebody is a nurse, somebody is a doctor. My friend is sitting over there, she is a microbiologist, Dr. Siddharth. So Dr. Anthasala is working at a bathroom. So we have a different verticals, right? But we need to be, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about us. We need to be adequate in our knowledge section, right? We cannot have the knowledge of physics or we cannot be the space scientist, right? We can be a good flavor chemist. So if I'm being a good flavor chemist, it means I need to have an adequate knowledge what I'm doing and why I am doing. Right? So that's called adequate amount of knowledge. Second is your skill. The skill is something, it doesn't come in one day, it comes gradually, right? More you do your work, more you do your every day work very dedicatedly and disciplined way, then your skill develops, right? And third thing is your attitude. It is a very important part, is attitude. How you look towards your job given to you. See, we are all here, we chose the job, right? It's not we are being interested in somebody told us to do it. We are here because we love to do it and we all of us, best among best, right? That's why we are here, we are sitting here. So our attitude should be like that way. So that attitude means you are this attitude thing comes with some knowledge, skill, and experience. It grows there very, very gradually. But you need to understand, we all, all need to understand job is one thing, but actually we are in one way 
we are helping someone to go back to their dear and dear ones from hospitals in a good health, right? So that is our attitude here. That's how we are contributing to a society. Of course, we are, we are paid for our job. I am also paid for my job. Everyone is paid for our job. But inside, our consciousness should give us that attitude. So these three things but I mean, being you clever enough is that being you a space scientist, being you are IT professional, these three things we all should. Well, now we come to a little bit specific one. So to enhance your uh, professional skill, so we have developed a training schedule. I mean, uh, training format. This is, remember, this is not chargeable. This is free of cost training uh, format. So we came up with a form. You can ask any medical professional. So they will give you this form based on your requirement. What kind of training you require? You can just fill up the form and give it back to us. And then we can design your training schedule for the entire year. So what are the training and uh, training process we are talking about? So we give training in uh, base practices of Leverton and the pre-analytical variables in laboratory medicine. So these are similar things, but left hand side, the best practices of laboratory talks about what you should do, how you should do. The light, left hand side is talking about why you should do. So left hand side, I will say, the pre-analytical variables are, if they talk about the science behind what you are doing, that means for an example, you need to dry your dialogue. So why do you need to dry your dialogue? So the second part of the training talks about the science behind it, and the first part of the training talks about the best practices of level Like it, it talks about this, all the site selection, and materials, and patient preparation, all those things, which you could regularly need to it. Second part is the analytical variable talks about the science behind it. Next week, we give some uh, focus training also, which you can handle. It's about uh, those focus trainings are about the pediatric sample collection, arterial blood glass sample collection, and specimen management, I mean, uh, specimen management solution in critical care, and also the unit specimen management. So all those things are very detailed learning program. If you want, you can avail it. These are not just one time program, these are very, very hand coordinated training program. I'm talking about it because in our experience, we have seen that people just don't know about all those things. So I'm just avoiding you so you can come to us and you can give this training program. I mean, design this training program for you and the actual excellence of our laboratory or the entire laboratory training program can be given for you. And then comes the, uh, it's a very uh, clinical consultancy service, it's a very kind of, you know, uh, uh, on demand training uh, or program, but these are not training program, these are kind of uh, uh, audit program, where you can actually come to us and we can come back to your laboratory and study your laboratory workflow, and we can tell you that where are the stages you need to work on or you have room uh, to improve. So based on these three studies, uh, I mean, first we call the sample technique acquisition and digging star program is basically people who are still doing the open collection for them. Next is called PEQC. This is for anyone from sample collection to your laboratory process. We go to your laboratory, analyze your workflow, and we will tell you if there is any room for improvement present in your workflow. And based on that, you can customize your training program. Third is called the platform program. This is a very focused program. When you go for your NMDL audit, before you go to NMDL audit, this is kind of a mock training of NMDL. So, before you go for anything, we can come back to you, do a mock drill, and can tell you what, what are the scope where you can get the NC. So, before going to anything, you can already uh, improve your NCs, and then your NMD will be much more easier for you. So, these are the few programs we actually talk about. And when I was sitting there and 
thinking of what to present after Dr. Ravita presented. So I thought, why not uh, I talk about this arterial blindness collection? It's very really important. It's very really critical for it. So we'll talk about the arterial blindness collection method and what are the devices you need to focus on. Don't think that really is talking about their syringes. Of course, uh, we provide this kind of syringes, but it is really, really at this moment, it's very important. So I would like to say about a few things. And then I think we have some 15 minutes time, right? So I will, I will use that 15 minutes uh, with actual left escalation effects. Okay. <laughs> so, Arterial blood test collection in a uh, normal process, uh, how are you doing? You are doing it with pre heparin syringe or you are doing your own home at the time. So many of the time uh, we see that people are actually taking normal syringe and they are flushing it with the liquid heparin and they are collecting the samples, right? So our motto or what we are trying to change the game is to, uh, I would say promote, but we want to improve the process to the pre heparinized uh, series, arterial blood escalation. There are a lot of advantages with uh, this uh, ready made series. So, that, that's what I'm going to talk about it. So, there are a few things that blood based analysis shows important uh, physiological function. Uh, that one is hematosis and another one is acid based equilibrium. So, I am not going to tell you how to do it because you guys already know it, but uh, this is just an introduction of it. I mean, you all know that acidosis and uh, alchemy or alchemy condition, what happens in our body and how arterial blood gas collection, I mean, ABG testing can give you the indication of all those things with so the respiratory disease or the metabolic disease. Uh, so how you can get that. I know you guys are, uh, do this analysis every day, I mean day and day in and day out. So I'm not going to give you all this, talk about all those things. But what I'm talking about is that, yeah. <laughs> Few factors which actually uh, many of times we get a call like so we, we are not getting the blood gas uh, you know pro I'm not getting the proper result with your syringe or your instrument right so mostly uh, what happens uh, with the our uh, ABG is that if you are doing it with your homemade uh, process where you make a syringe and detail. You flush it with the liquid happening and then you collect your blood. What happens the they have heparin to blood ratio actually gets hampered. Okay. And when you do this kind of open collection, lot of times, many times, a, you cannot prevent the air bubble. It's quite impossible to prevent that a micro air bubble present in the blood sample. Right. Second thing is hampered digestion. Your heparin is liquid form, right? It's a liquid phase of heparin because those are mostly sodium heparin. Sodium heparin comes only in the liquid format and that liquid actually dilutes the sample. And the sample clotting is another factor. Sample clotting just, it is, uh, I will talk about why it happens and sample contamination is another factor. So mostly the but when we talk about these errors, they, these errors actually happen due to improper handling, transport, and storage, and delayed sample analysis. And this hemolysis happens. Sir, uh, Doctor, uh, sir, uh, sir was talking about some. Uh, someone has taken blood with the 23 positive and like they are getting hyperthermia, right? So hemolysis happens. Yeah, that's a very I was thinking that this, this is a very good observation is that the needle is actually can cause your devices, right? So choosing of your needle and device is a very important factor. And second comes the sample misidentification. What Madam was talking about, leveling is very important. So you know, this portion of the slide is talks about the sample integrity and this portion is talking about how you should handle your uh, sample. Okay, 
So factors affecting the quality of ABG result is the type of specimen container. So that is the type of syringe and its permeability. So if your syringe is of a good quality, that means the syringe is less permeable to the environmental gas. Right? If your syringe is highly permeable, any plastic you take will keep some liquid inside the plastic. At a certain level, they will start evaporating because no plastic in the world they are not 100% impermeable. They are permeable. So it requires that you need to understand what is the importance of the ingredients of the instruments, I mean devices you are using. So if your syringe is not impermeable to the gases, they will start transfuse outside gases inside the sample and that will actually hamper your result. However, it might seem to you that it's very really insignificant, but the results are get, result gets affected. That's true. Second is the container preparation of an anticoagulant. So when we prepare the container or the syringe, we take the liquid pepper in and then flush it out. So we really, really don't know if we are maintaining the uh, heparin concentration inside the tube. And sometimes, not sometimes, every heparin container, when it kept for a very long time, and used, I mean, you have used it 15, 20, 30, 40 times, and when the heparin is getting exhausted, you can be sure that the concentration of heparin is actually getting exhausted. So at the end level of point even, taking the uh, heparin from at the bottom of your heparin container, you are not 100% sure that your concentration is actually maintained. So to understand this practice, uh, so I'm not showing you this uh, practice because this you are know you are doing. You take the heparin, then you flush it out, and then you take the blood, right? So this is the slide actually showing how the gas permeability is. So you see, this is the this one is the this is the plastic periphery. Right? You see this. Can you just So this container, actually, if it is a single event uh, tube and uh, series, they actually allows the gas permeability. But if your tube is dual layer, you can ask your vector, is the plastic is dual layer, then the permeability is very, very minimal. So this gas permeability happens in a very, very nominal rate. Now comes with the heparin. So if you use the normal heparin, what happens? Heparin is actually a polyanion. The nature of the heparin is a polyanion, right? So they will be variably bind with the cations, right? So the cations means those are the most interesting, I mean, most observable uh, parameters of our blood is the calcium and magnesium. And if they bind with the heparin, which has the open end, so what it will do, it will actually decrease the cation levels and levels in the blood, right? So if you have to actually start picking up your calcium or magnesium from the blood, so the calcium and magnesium balance will decrease, right? So your result will be compromised. So what if you have a, now the question does my heparin is sodium heparin, right? It doesn't, it is already balanced with sodium by positive cation. What happens with the sodium happens with is that sodium again breaks through the break from the heparin and comes back to the blood. So if you are your sodium level will be increased. So the researchers who when they were designed in the heparin, they came up with a very nice and very uh, you know very simple solution. Let's bind the heparin with the lithium first because lithium is kind of a inert material. It doesn't 
react with any other very easily it doesn't react with other things. So they balanced one end of the apparatus with lithium and they plus another end with the calcium. So what happens? Both the end of the heparin is actually blocked and saturated. So now this heparin doesn't have the ability to give back the ions to the blood or the capture the ions from the blood. So this heparin is quite a balanced heparin and it is called lithium balanced yes, lithium, calcium balanced lithium heparin. So if your heparin is in this way, uh, and the one thing is this heparin, lithium balanced calcium heparins are not in a liquid format here in a solid form. So when you use these kind of heparin, they actually spray dried inside the syringe. So you don't have to take heparin from outside. So yeah, <clears throat> so when we talk about the liquid sodium heparin, it actually what it does, the dilution effect of liquid heparin may impact the result of the partial pressure of O2, electrolytes, bicarbonate, calcium carbon dioxide, hemoglobin, and other factors. But with the uh, pre-made uh, ABG syringe, they don't have all those uh, factors. No dilution and less impact on the calcium ion and the sodium. And according to IFCC guideline, the known heparin concentration should be within 12 to 20 IU per ml. So there are two types of heparin series. One is called uh, three, uh, with, uh, 3 ml and one is specifically 1 ml. So if you take a pre made heparin series, they will tell you that in a 3 ml series, you need to take blood of 1.67 or if it is a 1 ml heparin series, you have to take blood of 0 0.67. That means if you take that much of blood, they will finally create the concentration which will fall within the 12 to 50 IU per level recommended by the IFCC. Okay. So at storage and transportation that all those uh, syringe actually comes with the hemocard. So once you take the blood, that your uh, hemoglobin, I will tell you, I think I have that slide. Ah, this is the thing. So you expel the air and first you seal your heparin uh, syringe and then you invert the tube for five to ten, five times and then roll the tube in your hand. You need to do all these steps to mix the heparin in the blood properly and so that the clotting doesn't happen. So what you have to do once you collect the uh, AG I mean blood sample, lock this uh, tube with the blood and then invert it for five times and then you roll it in your hand to mix the membrane properly. Right? Now these kind of detail uh, actually they have uh, I think KDM use this kind of uh, devices they have an auto ventilation mechanism. So if you see, there is a green stopper inside the lid, inside the tube. So it has an auto ventilation mechanism. So once you draw the blood, so the air present inside the series, due to the blood pressure through the ventilator, it goes out. So there is no chance the blood that in the gas or the air present inside the cell that will mix up with the blood. Right? Okay. I will not talk about how you should take it. I mean how you should do the energy collection. You all do it about it. So one thing after not after COVID, I, I think th those are in the guideline for a very long time, but uh, since COVID it has came into the picture very prominently and it become very paramount day now these days is the safety of our healthcare professional, right? So most of the there exists graph actually. Yeah. So if you see this graph gra uh, graph of healthcare worker safety, most of the delivery injury happens through the syringe. And yeah, somewhere I was reading, yeah, it is red. Right, right, yeah. 48% of uh, injuries happens with the AVG syringe. Because you know why? 
because when we collect the blood, actually protocol says you need to remove the needle immediately, recap the needle as soon as possible, and then you have to send the needle, right? So during that, as soon as possible, most of the needle will actually happen. Fourteen percent. So to prevent that, there be this kind of needle actually done. This is called eclipse needle. You see this pink portion. Once your blood collection is done, you can actually lock your needle. So that will prevent you from the needle sticking and they, they are irreversible. Once you lock it, they will not open it. Right? So we call it the preset eclipse needle. It is preset because needle is preset to 1.6 ml. You don't have to draw on that. It will through the arterial pressure. Blood will automatically be filled and then it has a set the features. Yeah, we have spoken about all those things, and I think I'm at the end of my presentation. Just yeah. thank you. Thank you so much.